uh, as we got started here, we are going to take just one session to look at Matthew 24. If you guys remember when we first started, that's actually how we kicked off this study. We were in Matthew 24. We went to, I don't know, 9 or 10, uh, definitely no more than 14, to where we got to the point where Jesus points his disciples back to Daniel 9. And if you remember, we did the 70th week of Daniel. We actually did two sessions, the 69th week and then the 70th week of Daniel, based on this discourse. Now, we didn't do it a lot of justice. And honestly, you could spend weeks and weeks, if you really wanted to, to get into the weeds and really talk about this stuff. We're not going to do that, and we're going to try to tackle this in one session. But this is an addendum session based on the Smyrna teaching that Anita did. She went through Anita, and I had an addendum to compare and contrast the differences between Matthew 24 and Luke 21. Most Bible teachers will suggest to you that they're the same account. Uh, and I don't believe they are for several reasons, so I want to present those, and I want you to come to your own conclusions. And some could say, you know, David, who really cares, right? Who really cares? Did the rooster crow once or did the rooster crow twice? You have different people with different accounts. But remember what Pastor Russ said? Note that there is no truth apart from the Lord. As, as truthful as we want to be, as faithful as we want to be, we're flawed. We believe, and I've said this before, that this book is a perfect work. Now, the translation might have issues, but the Word of God is perfect. It's God-breathed, okay? Mm -hmm. So we believe that. So if we believe that, then we hold it to such an incredible standard, especially as a student. I know I do. I believe God says what He means and means what He says. Every number, every detail, every place name, everything. All the idioms that are used, how they're used, when they're used, I believe everything is there by deliberate design. So there's discoveries to the diligent student who digs deeper. Okay, And sometimes people say, well, the Bible contradicts itself. Usually the contradiction is just a lack of understanding. It could be a translation issue, uh, or it could be a misapplication. Uh, there's usually a reason when you dig a little deeper as to why the dots don't connect. But when you start digging, when you do your homework, now have we made every discovery today? No. There's still things to be discovered, but you find the integrity is just confirmed over and over and over again when you do your homework. So, uh, so I believe it's important. What, the, the attention is in the details. What did Jesus say in Matthew 5? Not one yacht, not one tittle. It's like the crossing of the T or the dotting of the I. It's a call to take the text seriously, so the diligent student does just that. So we call Matthew 24 the Olivet Discourse. Why do we call it that? Because he's sitting, because it happened on the Mount of Olives. That's why we call it the Olivet Discourse. Okay? I'm going to suggest to you that I don't think this Luke 21 and Matthew 24 happened at the same place, but we'll get into that. I do, it's my premise, right out the gate, that I believe Matt, uh, Mark 13 is just a more summarized version of, of uh, Matthew 24. Mark's gospel account is the account of who? Peter. Mark writes it, but it's the account of, I heard it, Peter, Peter absolutely. Okay? And obviously the Matthew is account, account is the account of Matthew, and the Luke account is the account of Luke, okay? Uh, Luke part two is which book, by the way? Acts. Acts. Okay, so we're doing good here. So, so what I'm about to te teach on tonight, in terms of the comparison between Matthew 24 and Luke 21, 99 out of 100 Bible scholars and teachers would not hold this view or at least haven't discovered it. So you need to do your own homework and come to your own conclusions. Remember... This is the, my teaching verse, and this is the verse for this study, Acts 17.11. Luke is the author, Paul is, is, uh, is speaking, for lack of a better term, but it says, These, speaking of the Berean people, were more noble than those in Thessalonica, in that they received the word with all readiness of mind, and searched the scriptures daily, whether those things were so. So, uh, the Berean people is being praised because they were open-minded. They received what Paul had to tell them. But they just didn't embrace it, right? They tested it to see if it be so. So if you believe anything that David says, or Anita says, or Russ says, if you believe anything anybody says without testing it, you fail. You fail. When you get to heaven, you, you're not allowed to say, well, I believe something because Anita said so. You, I mean, that's, I, hope you I hope we're right, and I hope you believe because of what we say, but you need to test it. You're going to be accountable for what you believe and how you live on this life, okay? So, we're, so we ask that you set aside presuppositions, uh, set aside your prejudgments, set aside everything you think you know, so if, that if nothing else, you can be open-minded to the message. And then take that, receive it, and test it. 
Don't just believe everything David says. David has been wrong before, and he will be wrong again, okay? Uh, remember Edmund Spencer, one of my favorite secular quotes. There is a principle which is a bar against all information, which is a proof against all argument, and which cannot fail to keep man in everlasting ignorance. That principle is condemnation before investigation, or say it a different way, judgment before investigation. So that, that's true in anything in life. Do we really want to judge a matter before we hear it? No, we want to hear it, we want to be open-minded to it, and then we judge it. What's our ultimate guide for judging anything? Bible. Scripture. The Word of God, the Bible, absolutely. Okay? I so think that's, that's what was brought up at the uh, hearings for the Supreme Court justice this week, wasn't it? I didn't get to see them all. Yeah. I didn't see them all, but the constant question was, how are you going to rule on this? How are you going to rule on this? And she came back to what you just said. When I see it before me, then I will know how I'm going to rule. Yeah, that's wise. Yes, you're wise. How, 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 how can I be expected to judge righteously and fairly on a matter I haven't heard? Do we do that sometimes? We do, right? We get into trouble with it. Don't judge things before you hear them. Sometimes we judge things when we've heard half of it, and we get into trouble with that too, right? Yeah. So. As long as we judge a good half. So let's go ahead and, and, uh, and uh, just jump right in here. Matthew 24, beginning at verse 1. And Jesus went out and departed from the temple. So we're starting in the temple. He's in the temple. He goes out and he departs. Okay, we're good so far. And his disciples came to him for to show him the building of the temple. So Jesus is in the temple. Let's just start in verse 1. He departs the temple. He's with his disciples. And they're looking at or observing the building of the temple. So they're looking at the temple. So the temple is in view here. And Jesus said unto them, See ye not all these things? What things? The temple. They're looking at the temple, okay? Verily I say unto you, There shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. So say it a different way. What did he just tell them? And the paraphrase. Temple's fall. The temple's going to be destroyed. Okay? There shall not be left one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives. So they're leaving the temple. So obviously between that period and that and, some time has gone by. Remember? So the, the, the setting starts with them in the temple. They're leaving the temple. They're observing the temple. Jesus makes a statement. Now all of a sudden they're on the Mount of Olives. Okay? And as he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be, and what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? I'm going to suggest to you that the King James does a little bit of injustice there. End of the age is a much better translation than end of the world. To you and I, the end of the world is like, well, when's it all going to be 100% over? We already know from this study that yes, we have a 70th week that's yet future, but then we have a millennium, then we have a new heaven and a new earth, a new creation. You know, so we so the end of the world is maybe a bad term, okay? The end of the age is going to be a better translation. A couple quick questions for the group as we get started. How many questions were asked? I think three. 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 When should these things be? So he just told them about the destruction of the temple. I'm going to suggest to you that the first question is, when shall be the temple be destroyed? That's what they're asking there. The second question is, what, and what shall be the sign of thy coming? I'm going to suggest to you that, now remember, Matthew writes to who? Who's, who, who is Matthew's focus on? The Jews, absolutely. Who's Luke's focus on? Gentiles. 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 Who's John's focus on? Everyone. The church. Yeah, the church. Who's Mark's focus on? Probably Roman. The Roman. Okay. But Matthew is focused on the Jews. Luke is focused on Gentiles. So let's make that distinction the right way. So tell us when shall these things be? When shall be the destruction of the temple? And what will be the sign of thy coming? I'm going to suggest to you that question is talking about the second coming. We talk about Jesus actually, and let's be clear. The second coming of Jesus Christ actually happens in two manifestations. We've been making that premise to you from the beginning. The first manifestation is what we call the what? Rapture. The rapture. The Greek word is the harpazo, where Jesus will come as a thief in the night in the clouds of heaven and steal the jewels, the church. Who's the pearl of great prize? The church, you and I. You and I, we're the pearls of great price. He's coming to steal the jewels to which he purchased at the cross. That's what we call the harpazo. 
that will eventually, either at that moment or shortly after, usher, usher in the 70th week of Daniel, uh, to which um, uh, he will eventually come back at the end of that seven years. Okay, That's the second coming. That's the second manifestation. Well, he'll come back in his second coming, which is very different, right? All eyes are going to see him, and he comes to set up his kingdom. He came as the lamb 2,000 years ago. He's coming as what? The lion. The lion. Okay. All right. So let's go ahead. and So we got three questions. I want to point out something else, too. So they're on the Mount of Olives. There's three questions. One is about the temple. Two are about end-time things, right? You with me so far? The other thing I want to point out is they come unto him privately. Let's not over, we have a tendency to just read over that very quickly and very easily, but they come unto him privately. Okay? Is the Luke account going to be private? We'll, get, we'll look at that when we get there. Is it a private briefing or is it an open briefing? Okay? Verse 4. And Jesus answered and said unto them. So he, they asked three questions. They're on the Mount of Olives. That's why we call it the Olivet Discourse. And now Jesus begins to respond to these three questions. The order of it was what? The destruction of the temple. When is this coming? The second coming of Christ and the end of the age. We'll talk about what do they mean by the end of the age. We'll talk about that as we go. I'm going to suggest to you that it's that is referring to either the rapture of the church and or the, the start of the 70th week. And if, and if I'm right about that, doesn't mean I'm right about that, but if I'm right about that, that means the disciples asked the questions out of order. Because we know the rapture, if you're a pre-trib rapture believer, you know that the rapture happens before the uh, second coming of Jesus Christ, right? Well, why would the disciples do that? They didn't know any different. They, they didn't know any different? Right. They were a mess before Pentecost, right? They, remember what Peter said? I have a more sure word to you than our eyewitness account. Remember when Peter said that? He's saying what the Holy Spirit has given me, the word of prophecy that the Holy Spirit have given me, has given me, is actually more sure than what I saw with my own eyes. So remember when Jesus had to go to the cross, cross near the end of his earthly ministry and his first coming, somehow they forgot that he was going to die. Didn't Jesus say that openly to them? Over and over again, right? So these guys, did, at this point in time, these guys didn't have it all figured out. So they asked the destruction of the temple, but I'm going to suggest to you that questions two and three, they might have asked out of chronological order. Now we're going to get a summary. Jesus begins to answer those questions. I think he's going to answer it chronologically through the first 14 verses, and then he's going to actually backtrack and then be more specific based on the order to which they asked. Test me on that, but I believe that's what's in view here. But he responds in verse 4, And Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you. We have to stop right there, because deception is... The, the very first thing Jesus says is don't be deceived, right? So is that just for them, or is that probably for everybody? That's probably for everybody. Jeez, just open up the news, just open up your eyes and look around what's going on. Are people telling us the truth in 2020? No. Absolutely. I don't think so. Absolutely. I don't think so. I do believe that milk makes you better. Does to is Tony Fauci telling us everything that he knows? I don't think so. I don't think so. You know, I don't think so. So, what we might be being told parts of the truth, but uh, there is clearly deception going on in the world. Does that surprise you? Who's the god of this world? Satan, Satan right? I say God in lowercase g. We've got to be very clear about that. He does not deserve the capital G. Lowercase g, God is the god of this world. Huh? He's the ruler of this world. He's the ruler of the Well, Paul says the god of this world to the Corinthian people in his letter. And so, he, so somebody who is God of this world has authority in this world. So the rules of this world, if they're not submitted to Jesus Christ, who are they serving? Satan. 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 So we need to remember that. Yeah. We need to remember that. Pay attention to the people in the world, the leaders of the world who are loved by the world. And pay attention to the leaders of the world who are hated by the world. That should tell you something. If the world, remember what Jesus said, if the world loves you, you're not a part of me. You're not a part of me. If the world hates you, know that it hated me first. You know, so if the world loves somebody, that's that's your first flag, right? That's your first warning. Let's give this person a second look. Yep. 
And if the world, you know, Laura says, everybody loves David. She jokes about it. Everybody loves David. Well, I hope not, because if everybody loves David, then I don't have a very good witness for Jesus Christ. I hope not. So maybe, maybe my prayer was last week when I said, I hope I don't offend anybody. Maybe I should have said, well, I hope I do offend somebody, because I need to offend somebody and make somebody mad at some point here. I'm not doing my job. So... But he says, take heed that no man deceive you. So we need to be on our guard for deception. What's the be biggest guard against deception? You could do a whole study on it, but very briefly, what's the biggest guard against deception? You know the truth. What's the truth? The Bible. The Bible. Is, it just, is it just a few pages here and there? No. It's the whole counsel of God, right? Okay, so we're good so far. But he says, many shall come in thy name and say, I am the Christ and shall deceive many. Do we have lots of paths to God right now? Yeah. We do, right? In the world. Yeah. In the world. Yeah. Do you have lots of options? Do you have lots of options from the world? Oh, there's lots of ways to heaven, right? This God, this God, doesn't matter what you believe. All, all roads go to the same heaven. Have you ever heard that? You know, nice little stickers on cars coexist. Only one of those is the way. Only one of those is the way. You hear, you hear people say, oh, Jesus was a good man. He is a lot of things, but he's not a good man. Look, Jesus claimed to be God, okay? So if he's a good man... He can't be a good man, right? So the, you have three options concerning Jesus Christ. So if he's telling you the truth, he's God. If he's lying, then he's the biggest liar, biggest fraud of all time. That's not a good man. He's either that or he's out of his mind. He's either Lord, lunatic, or liar. He's not a good man. That's not an option. That's not an option. Oh, well, yeah, you know, Jesus did some good things. No, he's either Lord or liar. What, what's your choice? He's not a good man. He's not a good man. He's either Lord or liar or lunatic. Or he's out of his mind. Some of them accused him of that too, right? Uh, he'll say, I am the Christ and shall deceive many. So there's many paths, right? And you shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that ye be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. You will hear teachers on this topic sometimes say, well, when you hear of wars and war rumors of wars, that's just one of the signs of the end. Actually, Jesus says the exact opposite, but the end is not yet. You're going to hear these things. That's not necessarily a sign of the end. But let's focus on these. So we've got wars and rumors of wars. And then he goes on. For nation shall rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. H has that happened between when Jesus res uh, ascended to heaven and now? Has there been nations against nations and kingdoms against kingdoms? So we're good so far, right? Uh, um, and there shall be famines and pestilence and earthquakes in diverse places. Have we seen those? Yes. Okay. And, he, and then he, just, and he labels all of these. These are the beginning of sorrow. So let's call wars, rumors of wars. Let's call uh, kingdom against kingdom. Let's call famines, pestilence, and earthquakes. Let, for argument's sake, let's give them a vocabulary definition. Let's call them beginning of sorrows because that's what Jesus called them. Okay, you guys all with me so far? I'm yeah. not speaking gibberish. Okay. I want to, so these are the beginning of sorrows, these signs right here. Okay. You see them in Matthew 24. You see them in Luke 21, which is the biggest reason that people think the Matthew account and the Luke account are the same because they got the same signs. Well, let's examine it closer and see what's going on. What's interesting, though, when we get to Revelation 6, these same signs are in Revelation 6, strangely enough. Okay, and we'll talk about that more when we get to Revelation 6, but they're in Revelation 6 as well. But So moving on, verse 9. And this is the key word as we examine Matthew versus Luke. Then, then, he gives these beginning of sorrows, he gives these series of signs, and then he says, then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted and shall kill you, and you shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. So, what, so he, he gives these signs, and then does he go back in time or forward in time based on that statement? Forward, forward. forward in time. You see these signs, then blah, blah, blah. Okay? You'll be hated of all nations for my sake. Have the Jews been hated over the last 2,000 years by different nations and different people? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Who's the biggest that we know of? Iran. Russia. Well, Iran Russia. might be. Russia. Russia. I'm thinking of Hitler. One out of every three Jews on the planet Earth was killed. Uh, during the, the business of the Nazis. You think, geez, it couldn't get any worse for them. It actually can. Two out of every three in the day of the Lord and the tribulation are going to die. It's, it's incredibly bad as uh, Nazi Germany was to the Jews. It's actually, believe it or not, going to get worse. Uh, tragic. 
So, so have they been afflicted? Yes, absolutely. So, uh, so they shall kill you, and there shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. Remember, Matthew's talking to Jews, right? Mm -hmm. And they shall many be offended, and shall betray one another, and shall hate one another. Even during the, the Nazi Holocaust, there were Jews that betrayed other Jews, strangely enough. Our good buddy George Sor Soros was one of them, who's still alive. And many false prophets shall arise and shall delay, de deceive many. Okay? And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. Okay? So that's why, that's one of my, so I'm saying, what, what does he mean by the third question, the disciples? I'm going to suggest to you that Jesus, in summary, just answered up until this, he hasn't gotten to the second coming yet, but he, he put the end of the age ahead of his second coming because chronologically, that's when it happens, right? So he's, he gives this, this beginning of sorrows, then after these things, he's pointing towards the end, things happen. Ultimately, the last couple of things that happened, the love of many are going to go cold, could we be experiencing that today? Yes. We might be. I mean, we might be seeing that being fulfilled before our very eyes. Could you have made that argument other times in the last 2,000 years? Yes. Actually, I think you could. I think you could. So we don't, want to, we don't want to hang our hat on that, but we can definitely see that that, we don't have any problem with that being a reality today, right? We have, so uh, the love of many have grown cold. And geez, you read news in the newspaper and online about moms that, that put their babies in the oven, and it's crazy stuff. Crazy stuff. That is somebody whose love has waxed cold. Amen. Okay? And it's not just one person here and there. It's just, it's just crazy. But then he says, And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. Has the gospel gone everywhere? No. Obviously not. Has it? Mm -hmm. not. But Jars is still working on a few yeah. translations. Yes. So we might. So, so some maybe say yes. Some yes, maybe say no. in their heart. I gotta tell you, we're, we've got to be pretty darn close. I mean, we've got global television. I don't know how good some of these global teachers are, but you have Christian teachers going all over the world right now, right? You have missionaries all over the world. So if that's not fulfilled, uh, it's pretty close. Okay. And, but once all that happens, then the end will come. I'm going to suggest to you that that it has already happened and it's continuing to happen because the end could come at any time. You know, if we, we, to say that hasn't happened is to say, well, Jesus can't come, right? Well, I think he can come. And we're talking about the end, when he comes for his church, when the 70th week starts. That's what's in view there. If you have your Bible, you can write, after verse 14, rapture here. I believe in the sequence of things, that is where the rapture occurs. Okay? Verse 15. So, he, he gives a summary. He, we get the signs. We get the uh, we get the waxing cold. We get the gospel being preached. Then he says the end of the age comes. The rapture happens there. Now where are we? Very next verse. When ye should therefore see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet stand in the holy place. What is he talking about there? The end of the world. Oh no. The 70th week. Well, the 70th, right. 70th Remember week. Remember what we talked about? The Think about the 70th week. So in verse 15, now we're in the middle of the 70th week. That We know that in the middle of the 70th week from Daniel 9, and we're not going to go back there. We already did that. But this verse here, Matthew 24, 15, points you back to Daniel 9. And you're not probably going to understand much of what he says after that if you don't understand Daniel 9, which is why we did that out the gate. Okay? So when you therefore see the abomination of desolation, the 70th week starts with what? Just by way of review. Enforcement of it's actually the not the rapture. The, the enforcement of a covenant. It might be the same event. It may be at the same time, but it may not be. In the middle of the week is what? The 70th week is what? The abomination, the abomination of desolation. The end of the week is what? What happens at the very end of the week? Jesus comes back. The second coming of Jesus Christ as he comes as the line to set up his kingdom. Okay? So, so the rapture happened in verse 14. In verse 15, we're three and a half years in where we have the abomination of desolation. Okay, so now we're in what we call the day of the Lord. 1 Thessalonians 5. Remember we talked about that, the day of the Lord. I'm sorry, David, what did you say start, starts the 70th week? The enforcement of the covenant yeah. from Daniel 9. Okay. Now that might be the, now Gail might be right. It might be 
the rapture and the enforcement of the covenant occur at the same time. But the rapture could happen, and there still could be an interval. Ultimately, what starts that clock, according to Daniel, according to Gabriel from Daniel 9, is the enforcement of the covenant from this one world leader. Okay? So, when ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation. I bolded when. Why did I do that? Has there been an abomination of desolation in the Holy of Holies before in the past? Yes. 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 Anybody want to tell the group about it? Go ahead. The Roman sacrifice of pigs. Yes. And yes. the Jews then rebelled, which resulted in their downfall. So the first thing I want to point out to you is before Jesus, several hundred years prior to Jesus, there was an abomination of desolation in the Holy of Holies. When ye therefore shall see. Again, Jesus is saying it wasn't that event. Because a lot of Bible teachers and scholars and prophecy buffs get hung up. Well, it already happened. No, no, yeah, it did happen. But in, when Jesus addresses it, it was in the past, and he says, when you see it. Again, pointing to the future that it's going to be a future event. Okay? So if it didn't happen from when he said it to 70 AD when the temple was destroyed, then it's yet future. Did it happen from when he said it to 70 AD? Anita, how do you know? Pardon? How do you know it didn't? You weren't there. How do you know? No, there What's your temple. biggest safeguard? I hate to put you on this, and if you don't want to answer, I can... Well, in 70 AD, when the, when the temple was destroyed, it was a terrible, terrible time. But this time, Jesus says, it's going to be worse than there has ever been on this earth. So the temple being destroyed in uh, 586 BC by Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonian army, and then we have 70 AD, the temple being destroyed and Jerusalem being destroyed, this, basically the same way. One burned it, one just destroyed it. The other was burned as well, but um, the, the issue is there's a time that's coming that's even worse than that. that that's my take on it. So. And you can even remove all speculation because in Revelation, John talks about the abomination of desolation too. When did the diaspora happen, Anita? When was the temple destroyed? In 70 AD. When did John write Revelation? In about 95 AD. Okay. So it was after that. I'm sorry, I guess you're right. Yeah, so, so even if, so you can, you can actually put all speculation aside and say, well, we know that it didn't happen up until 70 AD because John talks about it as something yet future in his writing in Revelation, which he wrote 10 to 15 years after the event. It hasn't happened. You will have these goofballs teach that it has. And it's very, it very clearly is yet future. Okay? Very important. If you're attention to the detail. But you might have some, one of these guys come and try to stump you. If you don't know that, you might be like, oh, well, I don't, I don't. No, no. It's clearly yet future. Clearly. Clearly yet future. But yes, the, the, um, the abomination, the ultimate abomination of desolation is the Antichrist going into the temple and proclaiming himself God, that he was going, that he's going to be worshipped as God. That's what we found out in, in Thessalonians. Remember when we studied that, that there was, this temple was going to be rebuilt. He will go in at the midpoint and proclaim himself God. And that's when the Jews recognize, oh my goodness, this is not our Messiah. That's when they flee, and he starts to... Um, and we'll see, and we'll see yeah. that here, but absolutely. He'll cause the yeah. statue to speak. That's when you'll get the mark, by the way. The mark isn't, you know, do we? Uh, I don't want to take the, M the messenger RNA vaccine in, in, as much as any of you guys do, but that's not the mark of the beast. And you're going to have people say it is. It might be the technology of the mark of the beast, but the mark of the beast is administered in the middle of the 70th week of Daniel, according to Daniel, thir or excuse me, Revelation 13. Okay? That's when the mark is distributed. You will have an option to take it or be killed. And it'll be the mark of his name, and it'll be his image. Now, there's not going to be any deception with this. You know, Satan's got seven years, really three and a half years. Three and a half years where he gets to play God. Okay? And he's going to be in your face about it. He's going to be in your face about it. He's wanted to be worshipped as God from the beginning. He's going to get three and a half years where he does it. So he's not, it's not, he's not going to, no, no, you're going to do it or I'm going to kill you. That's exactly what's going to happen. Okay. We'll be raptured though. No. We'll be gone. Yeah. We'll be watching from heaven, sipping on whatever angels drink up there. Yeah. <laughs> it's going to be great. It's going to be great. But, but before we go on, look at what Jesus says. 
Whoso readeth, let him understand. How many read this? Yes. It's not for Pastor Russ. It's not for me. It's not for anybody else. It's not for Anita. It's for all of us. He who read, let him understand. So why do we talk about these things? Because Jesus wants everybody to understand. Not just the prophecy buff, not just the teacher, but everybody. So now you're on the hook to understand. Who has ears, let him hear. Yeah. Hear that's a little different. Yeah. He who read, who he who readeth, let him understand. It's not even just hear or know. It's understand. God wants us to understand this. He wants us to understand this. That's why we're taking the whole session to do this. So the abomination of desolation happens, as spoken of by Daniel, in the middle of the 70th week. Then we go on to the very next verse. Then, Anita just said that, let him which is in Judea flee into the mountains. Again, we're not talking about uh, New York City here. We're talking about Israel. We're talking about them in Judea flee unto the mountains. So you see this abomination of desolation. This mark of the beast is being distributed. you got to get out of town. So flee. Flee. Choose. Get out of town. He's talking to the Jews. He's talking to the Jews. Let him which is on the housetop not come down to take anything out of his house. Why? Because there's not a moment to lose. You, you forgot your mom's uh, silverware? Forget about it. It's going to cost you your life if you go back. Neither let him which is in the field return back to get his clothes. You're better off going with, with whatever holy uh, socks you have on. Don't go back. Don't pack. Okay? No time to spare. And, and woe unto them that are with child. Why would that be the case? Travel. Anybody ever traveled with a little child? It can hold you up, right? Uh, and that to them that get stuck in those days, same thing. Children are a blessing, but when you're fleeing and you have no moment to lose, they can delay you. And then he says, but pray ye that your flight not be in the winter, neither on the Sabbath day. Is the abomination of desolation going to happen in the future, which results the Jews to flee to the mountains? Is that going to happen? Oh, yes. yes. What's interesting here is Jesus says, based on our prayers, we can affect how it happens. Maybe not necessarily uh, every little detail, but we've got some say based on our prayers on how this happens for them. Now, you and I, I believe, are going to be in heaven. Do we love our Jews, brothers and sisters? Yes. Maybe, we should, maybe if you think of it, if the Lord puts it on your heart, pray. Lord, there's going to be a day that they're going to have to flee. I pray that it not be in winter. I pray that it not be on the Sabbath day. Would, would the Sabbath day matter to you and I? If this happened on Saturday, would that stop us? No. Would it be a problem in Israel? Yes. Yes. Absolutely. Even if you wanted to throw all your traditions aside, just think of using an elevator. Have anybody ever been to Israel? It's auto, it just goes every single floor because pressing the button is work. Pressing the button is work. Is that right, Anita? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, so so you, you, they've got a big problem if it happens on the Sabbath. So let's do our br Jewish brothers and sisters a favor. Pray for this future event that it not be in winter or on the Sabbath. It's bad enough. It's going to be bad enough. It really is. So let's give them that love and let's give them that grace. For then shall there be great tribulation. Does that connect with what we've taught in the 70th week of Daniel? We have the enforcement of the covenant, which started the 70th week. The 70th week is seven years, right? Three and a half years in the middle of the week is the abomination of desolation. After that, the last three and a half years, we remember we labeled the Great Tribulation. So Jesus is just speaking chronologically here. They ask two questions out of order, but he's giving them a summary of this in chronological order. And then he's going to go back and address the last two in more detail. But he's giving it to them in chronological order. For then shall be great tribulation, such was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor ever shall be. And except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved, but for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. And again, you'll have pastors and teachers say, well, elect, that's got to be the church. No, <laughs> way before the church was even a, a thought to the world, not to God, but to the world, Israel was the elect of God. So you have two elects in Scripture, and you don't ever want to forget that. You know, Israel is an elect, and the church is the elect. Don't confuse the two, or you're going to have a lot of problems with eschatology. By the way, most problems with eschatology, that's a fancy word for end time study, really isn't on, on, really connected to eschatology. It's connected to, connected to ecclesiology. Most of your problems with end time studies you'll have, and others will have, because they don't understand the church. They don't understand who the church is, what the church is for. You know, the church, would, they have, Israel and the church have different origins, different, different everything. They're, they're two elects, but they're very, very different. You don't want to group them together. You don't want to get them confused, okay? 
By the way, unless these days would, would be short and there should no flesh be saved, that to me is a technology statement. Do we have the ability to do a lot of damage, to do a lot of killing very shortly right now? Well, that's going to be the case in the future, too. You know, we think of, you said, uh, Larry said in one of the first studies, the, uh, the bombing at, at, in Japan is what, 75 years ago now? 80 years ago? Hiroshima? 80 years ago? Was it 80? 80 years, about 75 or 80 years ago, we bombed Hiroshima with an atomic bomb, right? That's child's play compared to what we have now. Yeah. Right? That's child's play compared to what we have now. And sometimes we think, well, let's think bigger, let's think bigger. And yes, we have nuclear bombs and fusion bombs and all that other stuff, but we can do a lot of damage with the small weapons, right? We've got lasers, we've got bio-engineered coronavirus, do I dare say that, you know? And that, I mean, I'm sure what's in the box is nothing compared to what's been, to what we're dealing with. Yeah, I'm sure of that. So we can do a lot of damage very, very easily. And I think the smaller enemy might be more danger, dangerous than the big enemy, because you can't see the small enemy. What do you do with that enemy so small that you can't see it? Okay, but that's a technology statement. If God didn't make those days short, nobody would be saved. Because when people start launching nuclear weapons and biological weapons, what are you going to do with that? Uh, you're only going to live so long when you have when everything in the toy box is just dumped out on the world, right? Then, so where are we at? We're in the great tribulation, right? Then. If any man shall say unto you, Lo, here is the Christ, or there, believe it not. Remember, Israel, who missed their Messiah, is still waiting on their Messiah, right? So when these things are happening, they're naturally going to be saying, Hey, the Messiah is coming. The Messiah is coming. He's got to come and deliver us. They're still clinging on to that, that truth. And they're right. They missed his first coming. But yes, he's going to come again for them. But if, but if any man shall say to you, Lo, there he is, believe it not. For there shall rise false Christs and false prophets, and shall show great signs and wonders, insomuch that if it were possible, they would deceive even the very elect. Before, I have told you before. Again, deception. Deception. Yes? We need to remember that that is for us today. What happened as the church started moving out in the first century was that some group guy said he was the Christ of many miracles, many miracles, but he was claiming to be God, and it was at the same time the gospel was going forth, and every generation has people that do miracles that do not know Jesus Christ. We have an example of a guy that worked at St. Paul who was holding spirit so he could make money and do miracles, and we need to be very aware of what scripture says about that book God, not miraculous. The spirit of Antichrist came onto the world right after uh, the finished work of the cross, right? So you always have these false Christs, these pseudo Christs, these Antichrists. There's a specific guy in view in the 70th week. But yeah, you, we're, we're never short yeah, of somebody. It's, it's for every generation yeah, it really to is. be aware of. It really is. Good point. So he goes back to deception. Let's keep going on. Now remember, we're still in the 70th week, right? Wherefore, if they shall say unto you, Behold, he is in the desert. Go forth not. Behold, he is in the secret chamber. Believe it not. If you go into the desert thinking Jesus is out there and he's not, what's probably going to happen to you? Die. You're going to die. <laughs> if you go into the chamber thinking it's Jesus but it's really a trap, what's probably going to happen to you? Yeah. You're going to die. Right? For, and then he says something profound. For as lightning cometh out of the east and shineth even unto the west, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. Guys, he's saying when Jesus, the real Messiah, comes... You, it's going to be something that not even Satan himself can duplicate. Okay? As a lightning flashes from the east to the west, boom, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. Okay? For who, wheresoever the carcass is, there will the eagles be gathered together. Matthew 24, 26 through 28. Okay? But Satan is not going to be able to duplicate this uh, he does, has a lot of tricks. He's going to cause statues to speak. He can do a lot of great things. Other false Christs and pseudo-Christs have done the same things. No, he is going to come from heaven in the clouds of heaven in something that not even Satan himself can duplicate. He's not in the chamber. He's not walking on the earth. He's not in the desert. He's going to come straight out of heaven, just as lightning comes from east to west. It's going to be incredible. It's going to be incredible. Pause real quick. For wheresoever the carcass is, there will the eagles be gathered together also. What does that mean? 
Lots of vultures. Mm. Lots of yeah. vultures. Lots That's of death. Speaking. It's I my understanding <laughs> is Revelation chapter 19, verses 17 through 21. That's to me, that's what he's talking about here because he comes in Revelation 19, 11 through 16. And we see, you know, the heaven opened, this, you know, the light lightning flashing across the sky. Uh, and 16 ends with, uh, and he has on his robe and on his thigh a name written King of Kings and Lord of Lords. But verse 17 starts out, and then I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried with a loud voice, saying to all the birds that fly in the midst of heaven, Come and gather together for the supper of the great God, that you may eat the flesh of kings, the flesh of captains, the flesh of mighty men, the flesh of horses, and of those who sit on them, and the flesh of all the pe all people, free and slave, both small and great. And verse 21 ends with, and all the birds were filled with their flesh. My opinion, that's the that's what he's talking this about. It's a great here. battle. I, yeah. I agree. I think that there's lots of different views. Some say it's a proverbial phrase. Uh, there's there's a lot of different conjectures. I think that really fits though, because when Jesus Christ comes, and we'll talk about this more in Revelation. That's the great uh, or the wine press judgment. That's the great judgment, not the weak judgment. That's the great judgment. And when when Jesus Christ comes back in his second coming, he's going to come out of heaven, but the very first thing he's going to do is conquer his enemies. He is coming back as a warrior. He's coming back with his, an his angels. He's coming back with you and I. We're going to watch. We're going to have our white clothes on. They're going to stay white. They're not going to get dirty. Jesus is going to slaughter his enemies. It's going to happen at the Battle of Armageddon. So if the Jews are reading this, oh, he's there, he's there. Can't be there, because the moment he comes back, it's, it's payback time. It's payback time. You rejected me, you persecuted my prophets. You persecuted the Jewish people. You slayed and martyred many of the Christians. I am the avenger of blood, and I'm coming back as the lion of the tribe of Judah. People think, oh, well, Jesus, he's, the, he's baby Jesus sitting up in heaven. And he's coming back as the conquering king. He's coming back as a warrior, and he's coming back to slay and coming back with judgment immediately in his second coming. So if he's not coming to save you, when he comes back his second time, he's coming back to judge you. If, if he's not with you, that's the worst day of your life. Fear not him who can take the body, but fear him who can damn the soul to hell. And that is Jesus Christ. So his second coming cannot be duplicated. Because not only is he going to come out of the sky, but he's going to come and he's going to immediately take care of business. So this guy claiming to be Jesus Christ, hey, if you haven't already taken care of business, you ain't him. You ain't him. Right? You love that English? You ain't him. Okay? Big <laughs> question. Revelation 19. 19 verses 17 through 21 because it follows exactly he says in Matthew 24 he says in verse 27 for as lightning comes from the east and flashes to the west so also will the coming of the son of man be and immediately after he says for wherever the carcass is there the eagles will be gathered together and the same exact time frame is in Revelation chapter 19. Jesus comes, and then the then the Antichrist and all of he all the armies are then dissolved, basically, because in 2 Thessalonians he says in verse 8, and then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. Just his appearance yeah. will wipe away the army. And those and are the carcasses that this is talking I about? I believe that, yes, yes. There's different views on that. You're going to have to come to your own conclusion. That's a highly controversial uh, verse, but I think that that connects well. Can we probably prove that? No. That's our speculation and conjecture. You're going to have to come to your own conclusion and on what's that. the 2 Thessalonians thing? Second Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 8. That's, that's verse 8, though. Dave, can I turn it for a second? Just a second. Yep. One important thing I want to show everybody that's in this, and, and I get so tired of hearing it. Uh, I hear people say, we aren't to judge. And I've yet to find one place in all scripture where Jesus says, says I'm never going to judge you. He will judge. And we're to be Christ-like. Now, our judgment is to be scripture-based. 
but we are to judge with love, sin openly. When some when someone comes to us, I'm going to step on it. And I'm not going to say, but there are certain views that are held that we are not to accept. We love the person, we do not love the principle, and we are to judge that and to basically rid ourselves of it. I mean, you don't rid yourself of the person. You you openly tell the people, look, that's not my beliefs. You're welcome to my house for your belief, your opinion. But you need to do a detailed study on that too, because there are cases where he says, "From such, turn away." Turn and away. There's, there's a lot of there's a lot of confusion in that. You have to spend a lot of time to really do that justice. But yeah, so there's there's a lot of judge rightly, and th there's a lot of sloppy them. doctrine on some of that stuff. That's yeah. a good point. So, so he just came back, right? He just conquered his enemies. He slaughtered his enemies. The birds are feeding on the flesh. We're in verse 26. Wherefore, if they shall say unto you, be no, I got to go to the next. We're in verse 29. So, and it's fitting our timeline, right, from our 70th week study. But uh, uh, the rapture, the middle of the week is the abomination of desolation. The end of the week is the is the uh, of the 70th week. He returns. He battles. Right. He comes back as the conquering king. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, and to say it a different way, immediately after his second coming, immediately after he returns. Shall the sun be darkened, and the moon not give off her light, and the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of heaven shall be shaken. Okay? That could be uh, things in the sky, but that also could be spiritual things going on. Remember, stars are angels, right? So there could be other things going on there. You can come to your own conclusions on that. I don't think it really matters uh, uh, in the grand scheme of how you interpret this, but it could be uh, natural things. It could be supernatural things in view there. And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. There's going to be a sign in heaven. I can't wait to see what this is. And, and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. It's like he's going to be in the, in the sky a lot. He's going to have a sign in the sky a lot. I don't know how that's going to look, but they're going to see their Savior. They're going to see this Lamb of God that they killed. It's going to, ah, it was him. It was him. And they're going to mourn. They're going to mourn. They missed him. All this stuff could have been prevented. Remember what Jesus said? I weep. For you did not know in this thy day thy visitation. A lot, they could have been spared a lot of things if they didn't miss him. And for the scripture to back that up is uh, Zechariah 12, verse 10. And I will pour out on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and supplication. And they will look on me whom they pierced. Yes, they will mourn for him as one mourns for his only son, and grieve for him as one grieves for a firstborn. That's when that's going to happen. Okay. Immediately after. Okay, so he's back. He's got signs. Okay, they're mourning for him. They're embracing him. It's a love fest. Okay, and, and, so we're still in the same time frame, right? What, this is after the second coming. What? Okay, so he comes back and he slays all these people. Now who's left? He slays Jews. his enemies. The Jews. The Jews are left. Okay. And he's going to get, so, so we'll talk about that more, but he's going to gather the kings of the east. He's going to gather the king of the west, which is the Antichrist. He's going to gather all these people to this great battle of Armageddon. And when he comes, he comes and he just dunks them. He dunks them. So the Armageddon happens right after the tribulation. It happens, yes. At the very end of the when Jesus comes back, he comes back in the battle of Armageddon and he slays his enemies. Blood will flow to the bridle of the horse, the Bible says. This is going to be a bloodbath. He dunks them. He completely dunks them. Okay? So they're back. His signs in heaven, they're embracing one another, and then, and he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet. And they shall gather together his elect. Who's the elect so far in all this? We've been talking about Jews. the churches in heaven. So we're talking about the Jews. Elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. They've been scattered. Remember, ever since the middle of the 70th week, they've been scattered. Most of them are probably in Petra, but some are going to be other places, okay? Uh, so they're scattered. And, they, and, so, and they shall gather together the elect. Who will gather? The angels shall get, gather together the elect. Who's the elect here? The Jewish people. From the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. Most, some teachers will say, well, that's the rapture right there. That's where you get the post-trib rapture. No, no, no. It, it all fits in what happened during the 70th week. They were there. The abomination happens. They were scattered. Uh, 
there was persecution for the three and a half years, the great tribulation. Christ comes back. He gathers his enemies, slaughters them at the Battle of Armageddon. The Jews are still scattered. So he's protecting them during all this battle. He's killing them. Well, at the Battle of Armageddon, I don't expect the Jews to be there. They're scattered. They're in Petra. They're in other places. The Battle of Armageddon, God is gathering the enemies. And, and, and I expect uh, China and the Antichrist are going to have a problem. Their armies are going to march. And we don't have time to get into all of that, but the Euphrates is going to be dried up. They're going to walk across the Euphrates, but they're going to gather together for this great battle. Okay? Christ comes back. That's the second coming. He slaughters his enemies. That's the great judgment. Okay? There's a love fest. There's signs in the sky. They mourn for him. They see, I missed my Messiah. All that happens. Then he sends his angels to gather them. They're still all over the place on the earth, okay? This isn't the rapture. This isn't the gathering of the church to heaven. This is a, the gathering after the tribulation of the elect, the Jewish people, to him, okay? From the four winds of heaven to the earth. So you, you, can, you, you really quote the rapture out of context here. No, no, they are scattered. And what Jesus just said a few verses earlier, so he gathers his, his Jews and he uses the angels to do that. Now, he stops. Okay? And now he's going to go back. Okay? So he says all that. Now he stops and he goes back. Now, and he makes a point. Now learn. So the chron this chronological of events stop here. So if you're taking notes or jotting in your Bible, chronological events stop here. Now he says, now learn a parable from, of the fig tree. Who's the fig tree? Israel. Israel. Learn a parable about Israel. When his branch is yet tender and putteth forth leaves, you know that summer is not. So he goes back and he says, well, how do we know when all this is going to happen? He's backtracking now, right? Learn something from, the, from, from Israel. When the branch is tender and putteth forth leaves, you know that summer is nigh. What does that mean? Well, the simplest thing I can uh, explain this to you is think of a tree. A healthy tree can't produce leaves, right? But a healthy tree can produce leaves. If the fig tree is Israel, and it's got tender branches, it's got healthy branches, and it's producing leaves, Israel is healthy, okay? Well, what two events can we possibly look at to connect that? The first I'm going to suggest to you is May 1948. What happened in May 1948? Israel, Israel became a nation in one day. Who said that would happen? God did, through the prophet Isaiah, Isaiah 66 and 8, write that down. That was prophesied in the Bible. May 15, 1948, by one proclamation, Israel became a nation in the day. So, from the diaspora all the way up to May 15, 1948, you really couldn't make that statement about the fig tree, because they didn't even have their nation. They were producing leaves, forget about it. They don't even have branches. They have nothing, okay? They become a nation again, May 15, 1948. Ooh, that's a big sign. Maybe we're getting close, right? What happened in 1967? Got June 1967. Go ahead. The Six Day War, and they got control of Jerusalem. Got control of Jerusalem. So from 67 on, they've got their nation. They get control of Jerusalem again. Okay, and really from May 1948 on, they became very relevant on the global scene. Their scientists came out with great medicines. They had great inventions. So all of a sudden. These guys have leaves. They're actually doing something on the world scene. Okay? So we see that happening. I don't know that I don't know if that's true or that's good, but when it has a big tree, when the leaves are there, they're supposed to be good. Mm -hmm. There's something else in that other account of the tree. Yeah. The leaves are supposed to be The hunters say, This is so boring, I gotta get out of here. <laughs> <laughs> I know that's not the case. God bless you. Thank you. Tell Kirk we love him, okay? Okay, right. this fell out of the uh, thing they were passing around. This is the okay. offering. Okay, just put it on the table there for now. Yeah. Okay. All right. So, I do so have a question here, though. Yeah. So, Jews that have died before, all right, I guess my question is if, if God is, if they're scattered now during the tribulation, and God is going to pull them together for them to see the, the true Messiah, what happens to Jews that have died before? Well, it, the same thing that happens to, the, to any person that dies without Jesus Christ. A very, very sad statement. No man comes of the Father except by me. So uh, everyone thinks, well, every Jew is going to be saved. That's not true. No, no, no more than any Gentile is going to be saved. But these Jews will have a chance to accept Christ as, his, as the Messiah? When, uh, when they're gathering him, they probably already have. Because remember, they've seen it already. 
nothing has been hidden. The whole world has seen his return. The whole world has seen his sign. They've already mourned for him. They've got it. They've embraced him. They've embraced him. Now they're gathering. Them. They're all scattered around the world. They're gathering. That's my view. That's my view. So May, May 1948 and June uh, 1967. Okay, two prominent dates. Both of those have happened, and we see Israel is very prominent. Okay, they are producing fruit. They are beneficial. They are productive in the world scene. Okay, so I'm going to suggest to you that that has been fulfilled. So he's saying, well, he's going back now. Well, how can you know? Well, look at Israel. Well, if we're looking at Israel, we have no problem with that being fulfilled right now. Okay, and he says, what does he say? Uh, so likewise, when you so see all these things, know that it's near, even at the door. Then he says, and somebody asked this, and I got to clarify. Verily I say unto you, this generation shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled. There are libraries full of what this means. What generation is he talking about? Somebody asked that question uh, when I didn't have it in front of me, off cuff, and I made this, and some believe this, and it could be true, and I said, well, they're talking about the diaspora, because the people that saw the temple fall 38 years after he said it would have been the same generation. That could be true. I really don't think that's true, though, because that's out of context here. It really is out of context here. So this generation shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled. Jesus says this immediately after he, he gives us the parable of the fig tree. Okay? So let's just explore one possibility about who this generation might be. This is conjecture, friends. I don't know that we've, we've, we've fully connected every dot on this verse. This could mean a lot of different things. It could be the generation that's, that starts in the 70th week, that lives through it. It could mean lots of, there's libraries full of it. Lots of people a, a lot smarter than me, with more degrees than me, have lots of different views. But Psalm 90 verse 10 says, The length of our days is 70 years or 80 if we have strength. Many scholars and many Bible teachers believe that a generation in the Bible is 70 to 80 years based on Psalm 90 verse 10. Okay? So if we connect this generation thing, which is said right after the parable of the fig tree, okay, let's look at these two prominent dates and see if there might be a discovery. And I'm not saying this is true, but I'm saying it could be true. Okay, so go back to it. It says, now learn a parable from the fig tree, which is Israel. When its branch is tender and puts forth leaves, you know that summer is nigh. So likewise, when you shall see all these things, know that it is near, even at the door. And he says, this generation shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled. I'm, I'm suggesting you to the, that the generation that's in view is the generation he's talking about, verses 32 and 33. The generation of Israel. So when will, which generation will not see these things come to pass? We've got, again, we've, we've got a couple big dates. If the fig tree is Israel, and we believe it is, and if the branches are tender and produce leaves, meaning they become relevant and fruitful, if we use May 1948... As a start date, let's just say that started right then. I'm not saying it did. We have no Bible basis to, to have a start date, unlike the 70th week. Unlike the, the 70th week prophecy, we have clear markers. We don't here. He just gives a summary. Look at Israel. When its branches are tenders and start producing forth leaves, then summer is nigh, even at the door. And then he talks about the generation. So if a generation is 70 to 80 years, and we just assume, we're going to make an assumption that May 1948 is the start date, 70 years would be 2018, and 80 years would be 2028. That's okay? the end. That's the beginning. Of so so um, if the start date is May 9th, I don't think the start date, if under this conjecture, I don't think the start date can be before this, uh, but um, if that's the start date, somewhere between 2018 to 2028 would be the generation that would see all these things. Yes? David? Why don't you figure this from the, when they took control of Jerusalem? Because that seems like the completion of Israel as a nation. That's the second. If you started it from June of 1967, oh, okay. 70 years would be 2037, <laughs> and 80 years would be 2047. Again, I don't know when you. I, I, I don't. I haven't connected from Scripture how you can put a start date. On when this happens but to put things in perspective when Anita and I stand up here and say we may be it's our speculation doesn't mean we're right but being plunged into a period of time about which the Bible has more to say than any other time in all of human history including the times Jesus walked the shores of Galilee and climbed the mountains of Judea there's a lot of Bible evidence 
that could be heaven. A lot of Bible evidence that that could be heaven. When's the start date? I don't know. But this puts in perspective it could be a lot sooner than we think. Again, this is speculation. That doesn't mean from 2018 to 2047 it's going to happen. Uh, it, it, this, I'd be shocked if it doesn't, but I don't know. I'm not going to set dates. We're not going to get into that trap. Um, this is a conjecture that this generation might mean the period, the people from the from the, uh, the, the the destruction of the temple. I don't think it does. That'd be used out of context, but it could. There's lots of different views on that, but this is one particular view. I don't know who started it. Um, it's not original with me. It may be true. It may not be true. Okay. Yeah. But that gives you something to think about. Have you heard about generation being the whole age of grace? I mean, there's all sorts of views. There's all sorts of views. Yeah, it could be. It could be. That, that is one of them. I've heard that. Uh, that could be. Um, I don't know. It's a mystery still. Yeah. yeah, I think there's some discoveries there. But I think that's provocative. Because what's going on in the world? The UN 2030 agenda is in our face. Okay? By 2030, the United Nations wants a one world government. Okay? Some of these things that they're doing now is, is leading towards weakening America, yeah. burying the Constitution, and ushering in a one world government. So if 2030 is their agenda, they're already escalating things. And again, God's not bound by their timetable. He's going to do things when he wants to do them. But all yeah. that stuff he's allowing to happen, if 2030 is in view, these next 10 years could be very, very interesting. Could be very, very interesting. Now, all these things be fulfilled. So, so this generation could be not just the rapture, not just the start of the 70th week, not just the end of the 70th week. So all these things be fulfilled. So it could be up to 47 before all that stuff, or 37 before all this stuff be fulfilled. But the point is, we could be very, very close. And I think, it's, if, I, if you said, Dave, what do you believe? I believe that sometime between 2018 and 2047, this stuff's probably going to unfold. Doesn't mean I'm right. I'm not setting dates. No man knows the day or the hour, right? I'm not giving you a day or an hour. Um, and I'm not setting dates. I could be 100% wrong, but it wouldn't surprise me if by 2047 all this stuff is ancient history. So, okay? Within that 2030 plan, there is definitely a statement about wanting to do away with all the so that the all what? All of the religion. Especially the Christian religion, because there are too many wars associated with people of faith losing their life. Well, you can't. Uh, and, and that is in that 2030 document. The one world leader can't be lord of somebody else's lord. Right. 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 But it says that specifically in yeah. the document. You know, if, when you, in face value, when you look at the 2030 agenda, you might say, well, this sounds good. I mean, these, are, these are some admirable goals. But when you think about what has to happen for it to really come to pass, you're going to realize, oh, no, no. The means to this end is going to be very ugly. It's going to be very nasty. We're not going to want that. You have to surrender everything to embrace the 2030 agenda. Yes? So something that kind of goes along with what you're saying is in 1967, the world said, we're not going to recognize Jerusalem as your capital, even though you say it's your capital and you got it back. And 50 years to the day, President Trump actually announced and recognized that it was that Jerusalem is the capital of yes. Israel. Um, they still don't have the Temple Mount. They still don't have the whole deed, you know, that he said. So, I mean, one of those could even be the start date, which is why, again, like, we don't know. But yeah. it's kind of interesting. Yeah. Can I throw it's a little there. in there? It's, it's there. there. Yeah. Yeah. It's there. 30 seconds. 30 seconds. Yeah. There is a new study in a group in Israel that is recognizing that possibly they have through generations because of what's been taught hearsay that the gear that the wall is not part of the temple mount and there and you seem like paul had supported that the troops came down to save paul at the temple so they're saying the mount the ground below it is probably possibly the temporary because it said not one stone left on another and the garrison was actually building confirmation to the garrisons built throughout europe by Rome. It fits the dimension. Yeah, there's right. there's a lot of confusion until you do proper digging and proper analysis where some of these things are. There's a lot of confusion on that, uh, even right now. But you know, the blueprints are ready. So some people say, well, but there's no temple. Don't let that throw you off. The blueprints are ready. They've got the heifer. They've got everything they need. Uh, it's just a matter of doing it. You know, you see how quickly when somebody puts their mind to it can put up a building, right? 
you know, it's not going to take much to get that building up, to start the sacrifices again, to ultimately have the abomination of desolation three and a half years <coughs> end of the tribulation period. Even if it starts on the 70th week, is three and a half years enough time to get the temple, start the sacrifices, and then do okay. the abomination of desolation? Absolutely. So don't let that throw you. Don't let that throw you that there's not a temple in Israel right now. Don't let that throw you that they're not sacrificing right now. That's a small point. But it's, they're ready. They're doing, everything is there except doing it. It's all ready. It's all there. Thank you. Yeah, we got somebody at 12, so we do got to be faithful to get out of here at 12 regardless. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. Now remember, he backtracked, right? So he's talking, he went back to, the, to Israel, and he's talking about the day that, 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 that either the rapture is going to happen and or the 70th week is going to start. So he's backtracking and giving some clarity. Remember, he says, learn from the fig tree. So we have a parenthesis. He, he starts a new topic. He talks about Israel. Then when you see Israel uh, prominent again, you know that it's close. And then he, then he connects a generation that appears to be to Israel being fruitful again. Maybe, maybe not. That's speculation. Come to your own conclusions. But then he says, heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. But again, but of the day and hour, no man know, not the angels of heaven, but my father only. Again, the rapture is in view here, okay? Not the second coming. So we're back on the end of the age issue. He's clarifying the end of the age. Heaven and earth shall pass. So Mark, by the way, we're not going to look at Mark today except this verse. Mark adds one detail that Matthew doesn't. He says, but of that day or hour, no man knows, not the angels which are in heaven, neither the Son, but the Father only. And I just point that out to you because that's something that Mark adds that Matthew doesn't. But otherwise, Matthew's pretty, you're pretty, uh, you're pretty on, good, on good ground with Matthew. He knew shorthand and he got more detail out of the Matthew account. It's interesting that at least at that point in time, there was something that Jesus Christ didn't know. So um, we won't bunny trail on that. We can talk about that another time. But then he goes on. So remember, he's talking about they the rapture. They changed what's happening at noon to another location. So. Oh, okay. Just well, then we can stay, Laura. <laughs> <laughs> but as, so he says, but as the, so remember, the rapture's in view here. The end of the age. Question three that they asked out of order is in view here. But as the days of Noah were, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days that they were before the flood, they were eating and drinking and marrying and giving into marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark and knew not until the flood came and took them away, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. It spent a lot of time on that. We are running short. But again, the flood was prophesied. Go back to Genesis for hundreds of years. Generations before it happened. Okay, it's eventually going to happen. It's eventually going to happen. This day of the Lord, the 70th week of Daniel, this tribulation, great tribulation period, it's eventually going to happen. People say, oh, he's delaying his coming. It's not going to happen. Or they're marrying, they're giving into marriage. The point is they're going on about their day-to-day -day lives. You could argue from this verse that the rapture couldn't happen in some times in 2020 because some people weren't getting married. Right? Because they were shut down. So the rapture can't happen until they open things back up. I don't know. I, I don't think I think that's weak, but I you know, for what it's worth. <laughs> but the point is, life is going on as you normally would think it were, and then all of a sudden, God says, get in the ark. All of a sudden, who shut the ark? God, God, God did. God shut the door. Did the rain come immediately after? No. Seven, no. Days. Seven, Seven days, days and then it came, right? So he's talking about the end of the age, not the second coming. We can predict to the day the second coming. We talked about that, right? Mm -hmm. okay. The enforcement of the covenant starts the 70th week. The abomination of desolation happens, happens in the middle of the week. So even if you can't put a date on when that enforcement of the covenant starts, when you see the abomination of desolation, you've got 3.5 years in, in Jesus Christ's return. Take it to the bank. How, how, how off was uh, Gabriel uh, when Jesus presented himself at the end of the 69th week? To as the, the Messiah and the triumphal entry to the day, according to Sir Robert Anderson's chronology. Okay. The days of Noah were. People say, well, what, what was, you know, that, what is that? Rampant homosexuality, rampant sin, whatever. Could be. Uh, but the days of Noah also had something unique. We talked about this before, right? Where the fallen angels merged with the daughters of women to create these Nephilim and these hybrids, these Rephaim. Uh, um, Goliath and his brothers were a descendant of this mischief, right? Yeah. Okay? So I'm not suggesting to you that angels are going to do that again, but I'm suggesting to you that the angels corrupted the human genome. In the days of Noah, 
there was mischief that corrupted the human genome. Is that happening now? Yes. CRISPR Cas9, transhumanism. Look it up on your own. We're not going to take the time now. But yes, there is gene editing, gene manipulation, vaccines with messenger RNA and nanotechnology. No. There, there, there is an attack on the human genome right now. Okay? So I'm not saying that's what it means, but I, I say that to challenge you and, and to make you uh, uh, think about that. For the days of Noah, uh, remember when in, in the Hebrew, when God says, Noah, you are perfect in your generation, that is a, gene, a genetic statement. Your generation was not tampered by these fallen angels and this mischief. Okay? Uh, so, for what it's worth, we don't have a lot of time to dig into that, but that might be in view. That might, there might be a lot more to what Jesus is saying there than what's at face value. doesn't mean, that's a conjecture, but it doesn't mean that is, but it could be. Then shall two, so he's back to the rapture, right? He's back to the rapture, back to the ends of the age. And then he says, so I believe this is about the rapture. This isn't about the gathering after the 70th week. No, he switched gears to the end of the age question. Then shall there be two in the field, one shall be taken and the other left. Two women shall be grinding at the mill, one taken and the other left. Watch therefore, for ye know not what hour your Lord doth come. But know that if the goodman of the house had known and in what watch the thief would come? Again, he's, this is the, what, what coming is it? The coming of a thief. He's coming as a thief of the night, right? First Thessalonians chapter 4, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. He comes a thief to the children of the night, uh, but the children of the day are not caught unaware. Remember we talked about that? He comes as a thief. But know that if the good men of the house had known in what watch the thief would come, he would have watched and would not have suffered his house to be broken into. So watch. Pay attention. He's coming. You don't know when. Be ready. Don't be the virgin. You don't have the oil in the lamp. Be the virgin that has the oil. You're the bride of Christ. The oil is the Holy Spirit. Have that Holy Spirit in your lamp. Have that Holy Spirit in your heart. Therefore, be also ready, for in such an hour ye think not the Son of Man cometh. Who then is a faithful and wise servant, who his Lord hath made ruler over his house, to give them meat in due season? Blessed is that servant who his Lord, when he comes, shall find so doing. Verily I say unto you, that he shall make him ruler over, over all his goods. If you and I are doing what we're supposed to be doing when the Lord comes back, there will be a reward, a blessing from the Lord. Okay, I'm not talk This isn't about salvation or justification. This is about an inheritance and a reward. You will be rewarded when you come back and you're doing what the Lord calls you to do, what you're supposed to be doing. But, and if that evil servant shall say in his heart, my Lord delayeth his coming, and shall begin to smite his fellow servants, and to eat and drink with the drunkens. The Lord of that servant shall come in a day which he looketh not for him, and in an hour that he is not aware of, and shall cut him asunder, and appoint him his portion with the hypocrites. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Weeping and gnashing of teeth. Some strong Arminians would say, well, they, that person wasn't ready and wasn't saved. Um, others would say that that is um, an inheritance. They lost their inheritance. It doesn't matter. <laughs> it doesn't. I mean, I, I guess it matters. I, I don't think this has to do with justification. I think this person had much to gain and lost. Mm -hmm. Why is there crying in heaven? We're going to answer that question when we get in Revelation because he wipes away every tear. Why would people be crying in heaven? And, and there's good answers to that. Maybe my brother didn't make it and I didn't tell him about Jesus Christ. Maybe my friend didn't make it and I didn't tell him about Jesus Christ. But it could be when I see what I forfeited, what I could have had. Is everybody equal when they get to heaven? No. When I see what I could have had and what I forfeited for something stupid, for sin, for, for selfishness, whatever, I think that's going to break our hearts. Amen. In hindsight, every stupid thing we do in the flesh was not worth it. You know? This is the day the Lord has made. This is the day the Lord has made. Let's serve him today. Stop. We, I just said this before. We've got to get out of what the Lord will permit and get in this mindset. What will the Lord want? What does he want? What does he desire? What does he, what does he, what does he desire of me? You know? Not what, what, how much can I get away with, Lord, and still get to heaven with a decent inheritance? We've got to stop thinking like that. We've got to stop thinking like that. Less on the rules and more on opportunity. Yes. Yes, we got to focus on relationship. We've got to focus on relationship. Pastor Russ said something profound. I know we're running out of time, but he said, uh, "When you're when you're focused on Him, you know." Uh, I guess I'm, I'm trying to figure out how he said it in the moment. 
when we, fo I'll just paraphrase what I think he said, what he said to me anyway. I don't know if he said it to you. When you're focused on earthly things, you're going to get into problems. But when you focus on heavenly things, when you focus on him, the same things can be going on in your life, but it doesn't affect you the same way. Why? Because your focus is on him. Your joy is in him. Your peace is in him. None of this other stuff matters. That Heavenly things are eternal. Earthly things are temporal. We don't want to waste our time worrying about earthly things. You know, in this end time study, some of you might get anxious from time to time because some of this stuff is a little spooky. Messenger RNA is spooky. Nanotechnology vaccines are spooky, right? We can get nervous about that, start going online doing all this research and get, and get into a panic attack. It's fine to know it, but we don't stress on what's going on in the world. We stress on who holds the world in the palm of his hand. That's Jesus Christ, right? Jesus Christ. Can I get an amen? amen? We focus on the one, the conqueror of death, hell, and the grave who holds the universe in his hand. He measures the stars by the span of his hand. He's a big, big God. Amen? Amen. 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 He's got you. Don't fear the person that can destroy the body. Fear the person who can damn the soul to hell. I'm paraphrasing Matthew. It might be in multiple uh, Gospels. But our fear, our, and I, I mean respect, respect. Jesus Christ. That's the person you need to be worried about. That's the person you need to be focused on. If you don't know Jesus Christ, that's the only thing you should fear. Forget about anything else. If you don't know Jesus Christ and that trumpet sounds, you've got big problems. So let's go to Luke. We've got 10 minutes. We don't really need to read a lot of Luke. I just want to show you the differences. So I'm going to read, uh, beginning at verse 5 in Luke 21. So what are the differences between Matthew and Luke? And as some spoke of the temple, I bolded some, that's important, how it was adorned with good, goodly stones and gifts, he said, As for these things which ye behold, the days will come in which there shall not be left one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. And they asked him, saying, Master, but when shall these things be, and what sign will there be when these things come to pass? couple quick things. Uh, it looks very similar to Matthew, but are the questions the same? No. No. Is, the, is it a private meeting? No. no. Doesn't look like it. Well, well, let's put that on the shelf for now and keep reading. But it doesn't look like a private meeting. It definitely doesn't look like it's on the Mount of Olives. It looks like it's right there at the temple. Okay, so we've got different locations, different questions, and maybe a different audience. Okay, that's your first tip. But we got different questions. That was the question in Luke, according to the slide. And then you have the question in Matthew shown side by side on the slide. Okay, the, the question, both questions of Luke focus on the temple. There is no question about the end of the age or the second coming. Okay, so they're not the same questions. Two questions for Luke, three questions for Matthew. Both questions for Luke deal with the temple. One question for Matthew is with the temple. The other two are, are yet future. Okay. And so Luke goes on, verse 8, And he said, Take heed that ye not be deceived, for many shall come in thy name, saying, I am the Christ, of deception. Those are, those are similar so far, okay? So we, we can see why people would think these are the same, okay? Um, Take heed that no one deceive you, for many shall come in thy name, saying, I am Christ, and the time draweth near. Go ye not, therefore, after them. But when ye shall hear of wars and commotions, be not terrified, for these things must first come to pass, but the end is not by... And said he unto them, Nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. The same signs. So we see a lot of similarities, right? Okay? So, so we know it must be the same account. It's not exactly the same, but they're very similar. There's the signs again. We'll move on. They're also in Revelation, strangely enough. And he goes on with what, we, what Matthew called the beginning of sorrow. So we're seeing the beginning of sorrows in Luke, just like we did in Matthew. And great earthquakes shall be in diverse places, and famines, and pestilence, and fearful sights, and great signs shall be there from heaven. So the, the beginning of sorrows, those signs are there. This is where we, most people miss. But before all these, he gives the signs. Matthew says, then after these things. Luke says, but before all these things. So Matthew goes right, Luke goes left. Okay? Different questions, different audiences, different locations, different times, too. We're going to find out, too. But before all these things, so you've got the beginning of sorrows, and then he, he goes before. They shall lay your hands on you and persecute you, deliver you up to the synagogues and into the prisons, uh, being brought before kings and rulers for my name's sake, and it shall turn to you for a testimony. 
before these things. I'm going to suggest to you that he's talking specifically about the diaspora, the fall of Jerusalem in 70 AD. Why would I think that? Because those were the two questions. They were both related to the temple, the destruction of the temple. We know from history that happened in 70 AD when Rome surrounded the city and sieged it. That's called the diaspora in history. Settle in, therefore, your hearts not to meditate before what you shall answer, for I will give you a mouth and wisdom which all your adversaries shall not be able to gainsay nor resist. And you shall be betrayed by both parents and brethren and kinsfolk and friends, and some of you they shall cause to be put to death. And you shall be hated of all men for my name's sake, but there shall not a hair on your head perish. You know, that might be that hair on the head perish. That might be an afterlife statement, but that might mean something else, and I'm going to come back to that. Okay, but the diaspora is in view here. In your patience, possesseth ye your souls. You do see it's a little different now after we went before, right? There's some things that are different. And when you shall see Jerusalem compassed with armies, was that in Matthew's account? No. He didn't say anything about that. He said the temple would be destroyed, but he never gave any detail on it. So this is something in Luke that's not in Matthew. When you see the armies encompassed, uh, compassed, with armies around Jerusalem, you know that the desolation thereof is nigh. That's your warning. When you see the armies, you know it's here, right? Then let them which are in Judea flee to the mountains, and let them which are in the midst of it depart out, and let not them that are in the countries there go in. For there shall be the days of vengeance, that all things which are written may be fulfilled. You see this? Get out. Don't come in. That's new. That wasn't in Matthew. But get out of town. Sounds very similar to what Christ is saying in the Matthew account, but he's talking about the diaspora. This sounds here. like from the, between when he was in the temple and went up to the Olivet. This sounds like that, that time in between there. Sounds similar, but there are there are differences too. There was, there was a time frame from when he, he didn't say anything the about temple. the armies, and he also well, said, "Don't go time. in." That was not mentioned. So there are subtle differences, and different accounts can't, in fairness, can't have subtle differences. So the but, disciples are listening to this, and then they get up the top and say. Oh, but not, but, but, but the disciples aren't the only people listening to this. Right. This is speaking, being spoken of openly at right. the temple. That's so everybody's hearing this. Right. Okay. We got five minutes. Let me go on. So, so you need to understand, Vespasian and his son Titus were the main Roman leaders conquering the various cities in Israel during this time until Nero dies. Okay? When Nero dies, there's turbulence in Rome. Vespasian goes to Rome to become the emperor of the entire empire. Titus stays behind. He sets up the siege in 70 AD, but there's a delay. This is all a matter of history. Okay? Over one million people got killed in that siege, but there are scholars that have reported, and there are writings that said no Christians were killed in the siege. Why? They had their warning. Who's Luke writing to? Gentiles. When the, when the Christians saw this, they remember what Jesus said. When you see the army surround the city, get out. They got out. In a matter of history, there are scholars that claim that one single Christian was killed. So the people that heeded the warning about the diaspora were spared. The people who didn't were, were not. And then he goes on. But woe unto them that are with child, and to them that give suck in those days, uh, for I lost my place. There shall be great distress in the land. For there shall be great distress in the land and wrath upon his people, and they shall fall by the edge of the sword, and shall be led away captive into all nations, and Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. Was there any mention of the time of the Gentiles in the Matthew account? No. What's the time of the Gentiles? We don't have a lot of time. Don't confuse the times of the Gentiles with the fullness of the Gentiles. Those are two things. The fullness of the Gentiles is what Paul talks about in Romans 11. I'll give you a hint, do your own homework on it, but the times of the Gentiles has to do with Israel, the fullness of the Gentiles has to do with the church. We'll talk about, we'll probably talk about that more later in the sessions and in the study. And there shall be signs in the sun and the moon and in the stars and upon the earth, with stress of nations, with perplexity and sea of the waves roaring, men's hearts fail them for fear and for looking after those things which are coming on the earth, for the powers of heaven shall be shaken, shaken and they shall... They see the Son of Man coming in clouds with power and great glory. So now he's obviously looking ahead. Okay. So I'm not going to spend a ton of time on the rest of the Luke account. He then looks on ahead, and it's very similar to the Matthew account. But the, the speculation that I'm giving to you as we move on, I'm going to scroll down to the end here, is when you compare these two and grab these two, you have those signs, right, what we call the beginning of sorrows. That's that box in the middle there on that chart. 
Luke says before these things, and then he goes into detail as to what happens, which describes the fall of Jerusalem, which we call the Diaspora, which happened in 70 AD. Matthew then says after these things. Luke does not mention the abomination of desolation in his account. Matthew does. Luke does have some end time things near the end of his dialogue, but Matthew is specifically focused on the great tribulation, the return of Jesus Christ, the gathering of the Jews afterwards, and then goes back and talks about some other things concerning the end of the age. Okay? So, and also keep in mind that little that box with seven, uh, the seven uh, churches, the seven letters to the seven churches, remember, uh, in Revelation 6, John gives those same signs, and he wrote that after 70 AD. Okay, We'll talk about that more when we get to Revelation 6, but those signs are in Revelation 6 as well. Okay, Did we do that justice? I know what the initial goal was to show the differences between Matthew and Luke. <coughs> the main things you want to look at when you do that is you get these signs, Matthew goes after, Luke goes before. Matthew, it's a private meeting on the Mount of Olives. Luke, it's an open meeting at the temple. Okay, um, There's different settings, too. They're in the Mount of Olives in the Matthew account. This discourse from Luke is in the temple. Is it, is it, is it trivial? I don't know. Uh, does it matter? I don't know. But I believe every detail is there by design. And I think we run into error. Anita, has your views changed with this discovery? Like any of your eschatology, is there? Um, no, it's just... <laughs> I just think it's very interesting. It, it confirmed to me that definitely that Matthew 24 was not speaking of the uh, 70 we or the 80 70 when the destruction of the temple happened and the diaspora happened. It was not because a lot of a lot of scholars will tell you that was all fulfilled. In the, the 70th or, or 80 70 when the temple was destroyed that's what they'll tell you and then they'll give you the idea that oh we are in it's an amillennial so we're in that age of grace it's just the church age we're done and when Jesus is ready to come back he'll come back that's amillennial there's no millennium and that's what they're saying we live in now and a lot of churches believe that so if nothing else, it will help you with error and false doctrine. Ah, it's a reproof yes, against yes, error. So, yes, so it, it's, ben it's beneficial to sound doctrine. Yes. Well, uh, next session, uh, if, you, if you want to do some homework, read Revelation chapter 2 and 3. Pergamos is next of the churches, so we'll tackle that next time. Uh, there'll be a reference to Balaam and Balak from Numbers 22 through Numbers 25, so you can read those for background. And with that, let's bow our hearts for the closing word of prayer. Well, Father God, we just thank you, Lord, for this study. We Again, we just we desire to know your word. The, the word of God says in Matthew 5, not one God or one tittle shall pass till all this be fulfilled. That's a call to us to take the text seriously. You mean what you say. You say what you mean. And uh, we want to know your truth. Remember uh, the words of Jesus in Matthew 24. Let he who readeth understand. Not just hear it, but understand. You want us to understand these things. So I pray, Lord, that, uh, that Anita and I did justice today. Uh, through the anointing of your spirit, through your anointing that you've given us uh, to communicate these truths. We want to know uh, about your coming, Lord. It's, it's going to be the most important thing yet future in our lives. It's the return of the King. The return of the King. We do pray, Lord Jesus, that you will come. We pray, Lord, for those who are lost, Lord, anybody that you have connected into our sphere, into our, uh, our, our area of ministry, Lord. Help us, Lord, to win the lost. We believe the time is short. We don't know the day or the hour. But there are signs everywhere that summer is nigh. The fig tree is bloomed, Lord. Uh, you're ready. You're ready. And by the way, Satan, <coughs> Satan looks like he's ready too. He's just waiting for you to get out of the way. Uh, we believe that when your spirit is taken out of the way, that by default we go with him. Because the Holy Spirit abides in us. So we thank you, Lord, for your spirit. We thank you, Lord, for your truth. Help us, Lord, to, to not just live, or, or not just to hear this message as we go, but to live it. Uh, the message of this end time and the message of Pastor Russ to, to look towards you and to walk by faith, not by sight. A lot of reasons we can let the world steal our joy, render us ineffective, but when we keep our gaze on you, when we keep our focus on you, when we keep our trust in you, you're the only one that's never lied. We, we're all liars here, Lord. You're the only one that's never lied. Help us to have peace and confidence and, and joy in your truth. We need to know your truth. 
Help us to be doers and knowers of your word, Lord, not just hearers of it. We pray this. We commit these, these saints to you, Lord, as they go. They're all gifted. Enhance their gifts. Put them in front of people. Put them in situations, Lord, where they can make a difference for the kingdom of God. May they build an inheritance uh, for the future, for the millennium and beyond in Christ Jesus this week to bring glory to you and bring joy to you. We don't want to do what you just permit. We want to do what will bless your heart. Help us to do that today. Give us the zeal in our hearts to do that today and in the days to come. In the name of Yeshua, we all say, Amen. Amen. Thank you.